Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I have a previous guest back on the podcast. I have Anne Richardson. Now Anne is a registered nutritional therapy practitioner. She helps people recover from disordered eating and her job is to essentially to teach people how to eat again. She explains what to eat, how much to eat, why you should eat, everything about eating, particularly if you've been in that kind of restrictive eating pattern. So if you want to hear more about Anne's work, do go back to one of my earlier podcasts. It's around the mid-20s somewhere and you'll be able to hear all about the valuable work Anne does. But today, Anne is talking to me about Healthy Week in Schools. Now, anyone with children will probably have some experience of Healthy Week and all the messages that are kind of given out with very good intentions to our children. But Anne is going to come on today and really explore Healthy Week in more detail, looking at the way that sugar is demonised, the way that children are encouraged to think about foods in very black and white terms, and to really think about how we could manage that differently to really help children develop a healthy relationship with food. So I'm really excited to be talking to Anne, and let's get to the interview. Hi there, Anne. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So Anne, could you just introduce yourself to our listeners, please? Yes, of course. So I'm a registered nutritional therapist and I have a special interest in disordered eating, which means that I see people with diagnosed eating disorders, but also people who have a difficult relationship with food. And I see all types of people, so young people, older people, male, female, all types of disorders, although I seem to see a lot of restrictors. I don't know why, but I see a lot of people who restrict Hey, no, thank you for introducing yourself. So you've obviously been on our podcast before. So I said in the intro, if anyone wants to find out in more detail about what Anne does and a bit about her background, do go back and find that episode. It's somewhere in the mid 20s. But Anne, you kind of last time we were on the podcast, you had really sort of talked about trying to support young people with developing a better relationship with food and something as well that I'm very passionate about too. And we talked a bit about sort of healthy eating, healthy eating week in schools, hadn't we? So do you Mm. want to just say a bit more about why you had sort of chosen that topic and why you wanted to say a bit more about it? Yeah, so last time we spoke on a podcast, you asked me what I thought we could do to support young people growing up to have a better relationship with food and their bodies. And immediately I thought, oh, healthy eating in schools, because I've got two children at primary school And I've kind of seen what they get taught. And although it's quite well-meaning, often it sort of ruffles my feather a little bit. I'm not really in agreement with what they get taught. And also I've heard from clients who have told me what they had been told at school and I was kind of pulling my hair out. And I thought, this is not right. We need to change this. And I remember you seemed to share my sentiment at the time that we needed to address healthy eating in school. So... That's why I wanted to come back and talk about that. Sure, no, brilliant. So could you tell us a bit, Anne, firstly, like what do you think is wrong with the way that healthy eating is taught in schools currently? So I think it's a great idea, but often it's poorly delivered. And that potentially is because the people delivering the message are themselves confused by what healthy eating actually means. Sure, we need to teach children to look after themselves, and that includes eating well, brushing their teeth, sleeping well, being safe online, etc. The thing is, some of those topics are pretty clear cut, aren't they? You know, there is no gray area when it comes to brushing teeth, for example. Everyone agrees that it's something that's crucial and how to do it. With eating, I'd say it's a little bit different. Healthy eating comes under, you know, the PHSE, which stands for Personal Health, Social and Economic Education. And it is compulsory for all schools to teach certain aspects of PHSE, including healthy eating. And I was going through the guidelines. And to me, what was striking when you look at those guidelines is that obesity is at the forefront. It's like it's the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to you. 
And as a nutritionist, I agree that it is a subject that needs to be dealt with, but I'm uncomfortable with kids being scared into putting weight on, especially given that part of growing up actually involves gaining weight. I kind of think that's a bit bonkers. I was again reading at the, the guidelines and it states that the pupils should know what constitutes a healthy diet, the principles of planning and preparing a range of healthy meals, the characteristic of a poor diet and risk associated with unhealthy eating, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a slight issue with that. Way back in my teens, I suppose, when I learned philosophy, I remember my teacher telling us that we couldn't answer a question using the main words of the sentence. So, for example, does beauty necessarily go along with pleasure? With pleasure? You can't say beauty, blah, 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 blah. You have to start by defining beauty and then also defining pleasure before you can even attempt to answer the question. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it does. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And I think it's kind of the same with healthy eating, except that I'm not sure that anyone really questions the concept of healthy eating. Everyone thinks they know what it is, but do they? Does anyone know? Do we all agree? If we don't determine what healthy eating is to start with, I think all of it is meaningless. Mm, it's so um, true, isn't it, as well? I think what healthy eating is, it's become so skewed, hasn't it? And so many different kind of diet plans, wellness plans, oh, I don't know, different methods to follow. It's become very confusing, hasn't it? And very complex. And I think people just don't know what to eat. Exactly. Often I say to people that my job is actually to teach people how to eat again. That's in a way that simple. That's the basic. You know, if the, the elevator pitch, that's what I would say. I'm not Mm. going to go into nutrition and stuff. I'm teaching people how to eat and that's it. And the thing is, the way I see it is that the problem with nutrition is that because it's so talked about, it's become very confused and very confusing. People come to me with extraordinary facts on nutrition that they've gleaned from stuff from the internet or magazines or whatever. And what I always say is that it's not because you eat every day that you're an expert in nutrition. I mean, Christ, I wouldn't call myself an expert and I'm supposed to have studied this. It's quite basic and at the same time, it's complicated. And so all the messages that we hear, I think have become confused. And I think schools are repeating potential messages that are actually incorrect. That's where my problem is. It's not actually a criticism of schools. It's just an observation. I know that schools mean really well. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I also know that they don't necessarily have a lot of funds and You know, they just have to do what they have to do. But I think often they are doing it wrong because they don't start at the beginning. We need to define what does healthy actually mean. And the narrative I hear is that healthy means low fats, low calorie, low weight. And I hear that from clients who have heard, have been given a healthy eating talk at school. And That's simply the narrative that we hear all around us in the playground, in magazines, on the internet. But perhaps we need to be a bit more critical and question the narrative. And it makes me think of the story of the five monkeys. Do you know that story? Have you heard it? I don't know if I do, but go ahead, Anne. No, Okay. So I think it's not really a story. It's it's put as an experiment, but I don't think it's really an experiment. I don't know if it's actually ever happened. It's more of a legend, I suppose, but let's go with it. As you know, from the first podcast, I like a metaphor. So it's not quite a metaphor, but it's an image. Mm. So five monkeys are put in a cage and high up at the top of the cage, well beyond their reach, is a bunch of bananas. Underneath the bananas is a ladder. The monkeys immediately spot the bananas and one begins to climb the ladder. As he does, however, someone sprays him with cold water. And then the guy conducting the experiment also sprays all the other monkeys with water. So the monkey on the ladder scrambles off and all the other four sit there well, it's wet, cold and kind of bewildered as to what just happened. Before you know it, though, another monkey is tempted to give it a go. And so he begins to climb the ladder. Again, he's being sprayed with cold water, and so are the other monkeys. When a third monkey tries to climb the ladder, the other monkeys want to avoid the cold spray, so they pull him off the ladder and just beat him up. Now, one monkey is removed, and a new monkey is introduced to the cage. 
Spotting the bananas, he proceeds to climb the ladder, but the other monkeys pull him off and beat him up. They don't want to get sprayed. Then a second one of the original monkeys gets removed from the cage and is replaced by a new monkey. And what's interesting here is that the new monkey begins to climb the ladder and the other monkeys pull him off and beat him up, including the monkey who had never been sprayed. And by the end of the experiment, there are no original monkeys left. So none of them has ever been sprayed with the cold, wet water. And yet they have all learned never to try and go for the bananas. Mm. In fact, here we are the monkeys when it comes to nutrition. We just repeat the same old stuff without ever questioning it. But where I come from, I'm just thinking, surely that's not a good place to start teaching kids. And I'm going to go back to philosophy here. You know, I'm thinking of Plato, Aristotle and Socrates. They have taught us that you learn by questioning everything. So if we don't question the basic information, then how can we build on that? Does that make sense? Mm, Yeah, it really, really makes sense. Yeah, I guess it just, sorry, my cat is meowing and now climbing in a cupboard. (laughs) I'm glad I've got a few monkeys and give cats at this end. But yeah, I think it's so true. I think how we we don't question, do we, this kind of the messages that we are constantly bombarded with about what healthy means. We don't stand back and be kind of critical of that or kind of think for ourselves. And we sort of carry a lot of assumptions, don't we? And messages that we, yeah, we haven't even ever really questioned and thought about. Yeah, and and I would say that all of my clients come with those pre-made ideas and they all have a fairly different definition of healthy. You know, they have similarities in their definition, but it's not always the same thing. What is uh, common is that I would say amongst my clients and actually amongst most people, and it's the same with school, I would say that calories, fats and sugar have almost become swear words. They're Mm. almost always loaded with negative implications. And that drives me absolutely mad because we need calories. Calories are simply a measure of energy. That's all. Mm. Basic. We need fats for the body to function. Without fat, you can't make hormones. And without hormones, you're screwed. Technically, we don't need sugar because the body can make glucose by breaking down more complex carbohydrates. But Sugar brings an element of pleasure to eating, which is encapsulated in my definition of healthy. And you often don't get that in schools or generally pleasure doesn't seem to be included anymore. And I have a slight problem with that. Mm, I know pleasure is so important, isn't it? Because I think, I just remember speaking to her, even to a friend at the weekend, actually, and she was just saying that if she eats anything that is kind of determined bad you know kind of sugary or whatever she feels guilty and this Mm -hmm. is someone without an eating disorder this is just someone kind of exposed to these cultural messages but I think as well with this kind of like good bad sort of dichotomy of how healthy eating and how nutrition is taught it's very hard then isn't it to experience pleasure from eating because you've kind of got always got this kind of critical voice in your head that's telling you off for what you're doing Mm, And I think a big part of recovery of my clients towards maybe the end stage is rediscovering pleasure, playing Mm. with food, cooking and eating what I call fun food that have absolutely no nutritional value whatsoever, apart Mm. from, you know, they give us pleasure. I think that's, that's crucial. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think are the implications of this kind of narrative that's taught in schools on our children? Well, I think at best it does nothing. But at worst, it confuses them and scares them. Evidence suggests that scare tactics are not good deterrents to stop unwanted behaviours. I mean, we just have to look at calories on the food packets and horrible pictures of decaying lungs on packs of cigarettes. That hasn't completely stopped people, has it? And as you say, the school often approach food in a, and, and not just school, but here we're talking about school. So they often approach food in a very dichotomous way. Things are good and things are bad. Fruit is good and cakes are bad. But then every school dinners, as they're called here, include a pudding containing what the school has just told the kids was bad. Also, schools run all sorts of cake sales in normal circumstances. And I'm absolutely not against those. In fact, people at our school would tell you that I'm the first one to bake Mm -hmm. and sell the stuff. So Mm -hmm. I don't have anything against them. But 
what's confusing is that they then tell the kids they can't be eating those cakes because they're not healthy. I mean, to me, it's a bit of a head screw for a six-year-old. Mm, um, very confusing. It's complicated. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you another story. I remember my eldest, he was in year three at the time. So he was around eight years old and they had chocolate as a topic. The teachers decided that the children would have an exhibition at the end of the term for the parents. Of course, all the kids made something out of chocolate. So we had created our own chocolate bars using cacao, butter, cacao, powder. We had made a honeycomb and marshmallows, thereby doing a bit of chemistry too. And yet when the day came, no one was allowed to eat any of the things the kids had made on the grounds that our school was a healthy school. Mm. And I was absolutely fuming. There was this kid who really wanted to try one of my son's chocolates. And his mom had said that he could because she thought the whole thing was ridiculous. But the poor kid was so afraid of being told off by the teacher that he put the whole thing in his mouth and practically swallowed the whole thing whole. And I'm standing there thinking, this isn't healthy. This is wrong. Mm. And the teacher also disagreed with the rule, but, you know, she had to go with it. It's not, again, a criticism of the teacher. But I felt uncomfortable that day. It was wrong. I think as well what's so interesting, isn't it, as well, that I think we kind of miss with the whole healthy eating thing is the kind of mental health side of things, isn't it? And just how... Yeah, how damaging it is to sort of really exacerbate that kind of critical voice and so much judgment around food from so young because of those messages that you absorb as a young child. You know, you're like a little sponge, aren't you, as a young child? You take all of this information in and it can really sort of set you up for the long term for a a really unhelpful relationship with food. And I think also a kind of damaging and kind of guilt induced relationship with yourself because eating then becomes this kind of moral thing, doesn't it? That you kind of, you're only winning at if you're sort of doing it right. Yes, totally. You would have to think of mental health. If you confuse, I think with younger children, you can start to confuse them. And also I think that age, you can already plant distorted eating thoughts in their heads. You know, biscuits are yummy, but naughty, for example. Sweets are a treat, which implicitly put fruit and vegetables in a different category, like, the boring food category, where you're already sort of paving the way for potential problem then when they're not actually thinking about body image or anything at the time. And also, I think it's, it's also teaching children, which is, you know, we have to think of children as our future generations. We're teaching them to reward themselves with food, which I don't agree with. And I, I see that quite a lot with school. To me, all foods are allowed But when I have a brownie, I am not treating myself to a brownie. I'm just having a brownie. Mm. And I think kids should be rewarded, but I think they could be rewarded with sort of like extra playtime, funky stickers, being given responsibilities, etc. I think that would be much, much better as treat, in my opinion, and would lead to adults not treating themselves to biscuits for having gone to work or and also thereby not punishing themselves later on for having eaten naughty food i hear that vocabulary all the time from the mouth of adults that i see and that has to come from somewhere we often talk about like food script and often that comes from the parents but also from schools from what they were told they were told very early on that those foods were bad and so they feel still bad when they're 40 and eating a biscuit which is really, really sad. And I don't really see preteens, but what I see in my clients is that the first seeds of an eating eating disorder are often planted at primary school age. So we have to be really careful about what we say to those kids, I think. We have a real duty to be careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I think as well, I'm just struck by how many people that I work with actually start talking about yeah, sort of developing kind of like, I don't know, cutting out sugar, for example, when they were eight or something, or, you know, just Mm. already just being so impacted by those messages from very young. And like you're saying, in a way, I guess it may not lead to an eating disorder at that point, but you're kind of already on a bit of a slippery slope, aren't you? If from so young, you're internalizing those messages. Yeah, and eating disorders, to an extent, they're spectrum. So I know a lot Mm. of even my friends, people I know who don't have an eating disorder, but sometimes the way they talk about food is fairly disordered, actually. So, you know, 
they'll mm-hmm. be fine. But it's kind of showing that in their head, there is still this turmoil about what kind of food they should be eating, what's good, what's bad. And that's exhausting. I mean, we know from our job, it's exhausting to have that internal monologue all the time and that critical voice all the time, even though you might not have an eating disorder. So true. And I, th- I think, Anne, as well, I think the thing that we need to, the government and just the wider picture of everyone, we, what we need to realise as well, like this thing about the spectrum, because I think people often think eating disorders are this kind of distinct kind of this, this distinct illness that affects this group of people kind of over here, almost as a separate thing from one's relationship with food, disordered eating or whatever. Whereas actually it is a spectrum, isn't it? And I think you're absolutely right that there are many people that don't actually develop eating disorders, but they are in turmoil around food on a daily basis. And, you know, if they probably had some helpful supportive messages which are going to help them develop a healthy healthier relationship with food when they're younger it may have avoided those years of turmoil yeah a lot of my clients don't have a diagnosed eating disorder many of them aren't underweight they don't fit in neatly in the category of eating disorders but they clearly are disordered in their eating and they they are pretty ill still or unwell I don't know if we can say ill but really unwell so we have to think of the spectrum I think and I've talked about younger children but I think we also need to think about older children I think that dichotomous thinking that gets taught potentially at school can be more harmful with older children I'm especially thinking of year six because I've had a few clients like that telling me year six was sort of like crucial for them so year six and above Because this is also the time when kids will get taught a bit of sex education and the topic of food in relation to our body at that point becomes more acute. So I've Mm. seen it several times when clients got weighed in year six and they were told that they were overweight or they had a healthy eating talk at school and then they decided that they should lose weight. They should cut out all sugar or fats. And then they got sucked into an eating disorder because all they heard was that fat is bad, sugar is toxic, calories have to be kept low you have to remember that children they're still children at that age even in your age you know they're still they're still young Mm. and they can have their own interpretation of what the teacher is saying someone was telling me last night that teacher said to her class the average weight of a 13 year old is 50 kilos she heard it as i can't be above 50 kilos And I think that was not even a sort of a healthy eating talk. I think it was just like a, I don't know, just a random chat, even maybe about math, you know, they were just talking and and he was just saying that. And Mm. she took that information, she jumped on it and she didn't let go. And now she is really struggling because she's 52 kilos and it's, it's a disaster for her. So we have to be really careful about what we say to them. I think they're really vulnerable, that age group. There's lots of things going on for them. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. And it's so, I think as well as, you know, I guess when you kind of got a developing brain as well, and you you can interpret things in quite a black and white way, can't you? It's not really giving any consideration for people that are naturally tall or bigger boned or very reductionist, isn't it really? And it can just be like an, an insignificant comment, I guess, that that teacher may have not even thought of the repercussions but we need to just kind of raise this awareness, don't we, about kind of the Mm. messages we're putting out. Yeah, and, and, you know, they're all over the place at that age. You know, their hormones are all over the place. Their bodies are changing. And that's pretty frightening. I remember thinking, you know, I'm not, not sure about this new body of mine. And I think schools are really aware of that in a way about the, the changes in the bodies. And they, they are trying to address that, you know, and they talk about period and they talk about sex. But often I think they, they fail to address basic physiology. No one, I mean, from the client I, I spoke to, no one seems to explain to them that boys tend to put on muscle at puberty while girls will tend to put on fat and no one explains to them why that is and I think Mm. it can leave the girls particularly feeling quite inadequate with their changing bodies someone has to tell them it's normal women need fat for reproduction that's just the way it is it might not be fair but that is the way it is that's the way we're made we're made we are always going to be in a way fatter than men Mm. we're supposed to Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So what do you think needs to be done? Like, you know, how can we start to change this and help young people develop a healthier relationship with food and their bodies? 
Yeah, so I know it's all very well telling people what's wrong, but you need to give them solutions. So I don't really want to say, oh, schools are really bad and they're doing anything wrong and, you know, you know, they need to change. You know, I think you do need to help them. I think, you know, people maybe like us need to engage with school a little bit more if possible. But I think generally we need to look at the adjective healthy in broader terms. I think we can't just look at a healthy body. We also need, as you mentioned earlier, to harbor a healthy mind. And I think for that, you need balance. And that's perhaps what we should teach kids, kids instead of teaching the nebulous healthy you know, we need to teach them that fruit and vegetables undeniably are needed because they contain nutrients that the body requires to function correctly. Is it a good idea to only eat fruit and vegetables? No, not really. I mean, that wouldn't give you the energy or everything that you need for your body to function, but also it would be really, really dull to just eat fruit and veg, I think. And I'll go back to my point earlier about pleasure. I think it's really important. We need to explain that pleasure is healthy. And by the way, that also needs to be explained in terms of sex education, in my opinion. I think it's completely bonkers to just talk about sex in terms of reproduction. What kind of 16-year-old wants to have sex because they want a child? You know, we need to explain to them that most of the time we have sex because it feels good and that's okay. You need protection, etc. But let's not suggest to them that it's because it's a bit awkward that sex is for reproduction only because it's confusing for them. I've heard young people say to me, well, I didn't really listen to the talk because I don't want children yet. And it feels a bit like I'm going off on a tangent, but I'm not because I think there are a lot of similarities, I think, in the way we approach food and sex and the subsequent guilt that can come after. I think mm. the way it's, it's been taught, perhaps at school or, or in the world in general, but maybe that's for another podcast. Mm. Right. Just picking up on as well, I think this whole thing about pleasure because I think as well, so many people I work with just feel, I think, guilty for like self-caring, guilty for having pleasure in their life, feel guilty for sort of slowing down and resting. And mm. I guess as well, yeah, I think you're kind of right in a way that I think, you know, from quite young, we're really encouraged to just kind of strive, 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 aren't we? You know, you have to be kind of working and being productive and ticking off your to-do list. And I don't know, everything's got to have a kind of an objective and a goal, and we're kind of missing that really important part of life, which is so vital for our mental wellness. You know, if we're just constantly striving, of course, we need to be striving as part of life. But if we're never kind of visiting that kind of pleasure, self-soothed sort of place, no wonder we end up feeling, you know, low in mood, struggling with eating, anxiety, all those things. Yeah, I mean, that's what we were saying before we started recording, you know, we're both and all exhausted because it's been a crazy year and in our field it's really busy at the moment because people are struggling and and I'm really feeling it I'm extremely tired and I'm literally counting the days until Friday when I'm off and it's not because I don't love my job I love my job but I'm I'm exhausted and I know that I, I'll probably be a better therapist in January than I am now because I'm I'm literally hanging on with my nails at the moment someone was asking me how I was hanging on and last week I was hanging on with my fingers I th- I'm, I'm at my nails now like, you know mm. and uh, Friday I'm just gonna let go but I think I need that downtime I need to rest and I need to engage in sort of pleasurable activities I need to do what, what feeds me nourishes me and then I'll be a better mom better wife better therapist I think hopefully in January mm. that's the aim yeah Sure. Yeah. I think it's so true, actually, just this whole thing as well with this year. I think so many people are just burnt out, aren't they, and exhausted. Yes, we need some pleasure and self-care and downtime. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes that's where schools go, well, it's confusing then, because we're being told about obesity, and, and now you're saying we should just, it's okay to, to have all those sort of, those treats and those like, what they call treats and all those foods, you know, we're confused. And I think we're going back to the balance there that I was talking about. We need to explain to kids that eating too much sugar could be damaging for our teeth and the body. And that if they, if they only eat biscuits and cake, their body aren't going to work well. We do have to tell them that. I feel quite strongly again about that because as a nutritionist, I know how the body works and, and it's, it's wrong to say you can have 15 donuts a day and you'll be fine. That's not what I'm saying. Mm. But I'm saying we, we need a bit of balance, but especially we need to remove the notion of weight and fatness out of the narrative. We need to talk about what's actually important, which is health, not shape. For me, if we make obesity the big bad wolf, 
we are also implying that having a bigger body means that you're somehow failing as a person, which is incorrect. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that earlier. Some people are naturally going to be bigger. It's just the way it is. Some things are genetically predetermined, like the color of our eyes or our hair. And, and that also includes our size to an extent, not sort of how much fat we carry, but how tall we're going to be. I see a lot of girls who are really tall and they've struggled with being so tall and they're trying to make themselves shrink mm. by eating less. And I say to them, you know, you can starve yourself as much as you want. You will always be that tall. We kind of have to make peace with the fact that you are a tall person. You are always going to weigh more than your friend who's five foot two. We can't all be the same weight. And going back to my client who was saying that a 13-year-old should be 50 kilos, I tried to explain yesterday that that's a bonkers statement because 13-year-olds come in different sort of mm. shapes and sizes. And so you can't expect like a yeah, five foot, foot three girl to be the same weight as a, a five foot seven. It's just wrong. There is more of that person. They're going to be bigger. And I also think that fat is an interesting word because to me, Fat is a descriptive word, but very quickly in the words of children, it becomes an adjective and it becomes a, well, I guess it is an adjective, it's a descriptive word, but it becomes an insult. And I've picked up my kids on that a few times, you know, if you want to hurt someone, you know, they sort of call themselves fat in the playground. And I kind of disagree with that. Mm. And I always say, look, you know, don't call your brother fat. You know, if you really want to call your brother fat, choose another word because what you're saying, if you're saying that your brother is fat, you're just describing him. You know, you could mm. say he's green or he's French, mm. but that's not particularly, you know, hurtful, you know, maybe the French bit, but, you know, <laughs> you know, if you really want to hurt him, tell him that he's, he smells, tell him he's, he's really stupid, you know, but mm. telling him he's fat, you know, honestly, is that the best thing you can do? You know, mm. that's the way I approach my kids so that I don't go, oh, don't call him fat. That's really bad. You know, that's a terrible thing to do. No, fat is not an insult. Fat is just a word. It's a descriptive word. Some people are going to be bigger than others. And that's just the way it is. It doesn't make mm. them bad people. Mm. So helpful, though, isn't it? Because I guess the way you're dealing with that is you're helping your, question, your children to stand back and question what they're saying and to think about it a bit more. Because I think as well, sadly, it's just from so young, I think children can start to use the word fat as an insult. It's so sort of indoctrinated, isn't it, in our culture? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much my, list, my kids are listening to me, but yeah, I did try to teach them to think slightly differently. But yes, yeah, very early on, really early on, maybe like five new reception kids will start to call their, each other fat. That's sad because there, there will be a kid who will have a bigger body for one reason or another. And that could be the first seed of an eating disorder. Yeah. And I think it's just um, so damaging, isn't it? I think what's just so terrible, I think, is when people just help, feel so ashamed or wrong in their bodies from so young. Because I think as well, it's very hard to shake that when you've had those sort of powerful, repetitive messages from so young it kind of mm. almost becomes a bit defining doesn't it yeah totally I vaguely remember thinking I didn't want to be fat really early on and it must have come somewhere maybe it was in school maybe it was maybe it was my parents maybe it was the, the society the, the, the country I lived in you know but mm. very early on I internalized that and I was very aware and very afraid of having a bigger body and I also think you know going back to sort of what we were talking about earlier I think I quite like kids to also be told that it would be it's dangerous to be underweight we spend a lot of time telling them that it's a no-no to be in a bigger body but we also have to teach them that it's also a no-no to be underweight and to to not eat enough because the fact is restricting could lead to anorexia which is the mental health condition associated with the most fatalities it's clearly not something i'm going to be teaching like reception kids but mm. my point is that restricting is more dangerous, so less healthy. It's more dangerous to be underweight than it is to be a little bit overweight. And, you know, some kids will be a bit overweight at some point because they have some growing to do, and that can mm. be ironed out. Whereas if you start restricting quite early on, as you know, it's more complicated to do that. And it is more dangerous mm. to be underweight than it is to be a bit overweight. I maintain that. Yeah, and no, I, th I think I so agree with you, Anne, actually, because I think it's just not 
talked about is it like the dangers of being underweight it's all about this kind of like you were saying earlier obesity being the kind of big bad wolf the fact that the opposite kind of being you know being very restricted becoming very underweight is not addressed and it needs to be not in a scary way but you know in an informative kind of way where people can kind of understand that it's not like and white the restriction equals good or the right thing to do yeah and going back to again what we were saying before we started recording you know we've seen a massive increase in young teenagers really struggling so we do need to start telling them about the dangers of restriction in, in a really sympathetic way because also we don't want to plant seeds in their head that oh you know I should be doing this you know that's really not what you want to do but we need to start looking at those children and guiding them a little bit better lockdown has been really difficult for them and again I find with a lot of my clients they've internalized a lot of messages that they've heard like public health messages on lockdown, be careful, you know, you're going to gain weight, you must exercise, don't eat too much. And that has snowballed in a lot of cases and people have started restricting and now they can't, they can't eat anymore. So we've got to be super careful what we're saying to them and choosing, we need to choose our words really carefully. And again, going back to school, the last thing schools want to weigh the kids. And I think it's not maybe that they want, I think it might be something that they have to do I think especially in year six and maybe at reception I think it's something it's part of the the guidelines I think I would like this information to be shared with parents not with children even Mm. older ones I mean usually reception kids don't get told but I think in year six they get told I'm uncomfortable with that because again the child might have their own interpretation of what that message is and I think we need to leave it to the parents to decide how best to discuss it with their child and sometimes the child will be potentially overweight and you know you need to address that I don't know if address is the right word but maybe you need to sort of look into that and sort of help the child you know sort of make better food choices not to make them lose weight but sort of to teach them how to eat better and Mm. that it's not just biscuits but we need to do it in a a really sympathetic way so that they don't feel like that they are on a diet and definitely and and wish yeah go ahead yeah no I was going to say as well Anne as well and and almost like I guess I'm thinking as well if a child is perhaps overeating has become overweight at that age as well maybe they're using food as a kind of soother or you know for emotional eating And, and it's looking at the psychology as well isn't it you know it's not helpful to just kind of barge in and say eat less biscuits Um, exactly mm. it makes them feel even worse because they're not stupid they probably know they have a bigger body first first of all someone must have told them at school someone must have have teased them about it so they already feel bad enough about that so if we say to them well stop eating biscuits you know because you need to be slim that's complicated because yeah chances are they are eating the biscuits because there is a problem that they are trying to address in their own way and because they're young you know their own way is to eat the biscuits so they feel bad already and then we're making them feel bad because they have a bigger body and then we're also telling them that they should be eating more fruit you know that's a triple whammy for those children it's really damaging and, and I've seen people like that they tend to be older clients and they sort of they come in their 40s and their 50s and they started their first diet around sort of 13 14 because of that and they were told that they should and then and then it became restriction and then it became bulimia and then became binging and, and then they became sort of the, the jolly old fat person that everyone thought oh well they're just fine they're just they're just you know it's just like Sally she's just a bit fat and it's fine but actually Sally inside it feels terrible and she hates herself and she's been hating herself since she's she was 14 for one reason or another so we've got to be careful yeah we have to be so careful don't we I think as well having this conversation with you Anne as well it makes me just really reflect on just how much more support and understanding teachers need. Because I guess in a way you can only, you know, in a way it's really hard to teach children about having a healthy relationship with food in terms of addressing the emotional and well-being side if you haven't had some support almost with that in doing it yourself. Because I guess, you know, probably a lot of teachers you know are are struggling with their relationship with food and it's really tricky isn't it because it's very hard to kind of pass these positive messages on to children about mental well-being and a healthy relationship with food if you are in a really struggling place yourself and in a way you don't probably really understand it or you know you probably haven't had a chance to reflect on it yourself 
Yeah, I guess there's two things there. First of all, you know, if you have your own problems with your your body or with food, it's really difficult to teach others. Mm. And and secondly, you know, I have a few friends who are teachers and I know they're overworked and they don't have all, all the time to, to do everything. And often, you know, they're being told to be like math teachers and German teachers and French teachers. And, and also then they also have to do healthy eating and they don't know everything because, you know, they're just human and, yeah. and if they don't get taught themselves, then how can they properly teach children? It's complicated for them. And we, in a way, we're asking too much of the of the mm. teachers, which is understandable. Then they just sort of repeat the narrative that, you know, they know because, you know, they've only got so much time. So I, I'm totally sympathetic with that. It's a big ask. Definitely. Yeah, no, a lot of compassion for teachers. I think they do an amazing job and I could yeah. never do that job. No, me neither. <laughs> it, it just makes me think as well, it's just, it really comes back to, doesn't it? I think in terms of like, almost just as a kind of culture, as a society in general, it's the way through all of this in a way is just really in bedding good mental health not just with food but with everything isn't it from so young and kind of almost developing that as a sort of culture mindset something in the same way that we've always embedded just diet culture from so young it's wanting you know just think how different our society could be if we're really embedding those mental well-being messages from very young and putting them into practice Mm. I mean that's the way isn't it because I mean prevention is just so much better than cure isn't it yeah and I think that's why I enjoy working with younger people because I just think that you have a real scope to sort of do good there to sort of quickly unpick what they've heard and and change their relationship with food before it becomes a real problem I think I feel like yeah I really enjoy that but I think it's society is changing and we are talking more about mental health and schools are talking more about mental health so you're right we need to embed that as much as the diet culture has been embedded and it probably will take a while because diet culture Mm. has been there for a while but but you know you know if we don't start it's not going to happen so little steps and then we'll change the mindset yeah definitely I mean the world is changing isn't it and I think Generation Z, Gen Z, whatever you call that generation, are incredibly proactive and passionate and body positive and, you know, talking about mental health, intuitive eating. And I guess, you know, they are the voices of the future and are going to have so much positive impact. So, yeah, there's lots of things to be hopeful for. Yeah, I look forward to see what they're going to do when when they grow. Definitely. Mm. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. I think it's been a really sort of thought provoking discussion and I really appreciate you sharing all your insights. It's been my pleasure. It's always, uh, it's always great to talk to you and I love your podcast. So thank you for putting them together. Thank you, Anne. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out all of Anne's details in the show notes. Now, if you're not following me already, do seek me on Instagram at The Eating Disorder Therapist. Also, if you are keen to dip your toes into intuitive eating and want to know if that could work for you, I now have a free course available. If you go to theeatingdisordertherapist.co.uk, you'll be able to be taken through to a link where you can download the course and get going. So hope to see many of you across there. Now, please can I ask you as well to rate and review this podcast? It's something that's taken me a long time to ask this. I'm now down to up to even 22,000 downloads of the podcast, which is amazing. But I know potentially we could reach even more people. So I would be so grateful if you would rate and review this podcast. Be really, really helpful. So thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. Mm-hmm.